Joining us now, Director of Domestic Policy Studies at Stanford University and Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Lanhee Chen, White House Correspondent for PBS NewsHour, Yamiche Alcindor, and New York Times Opinion Writer, Ross Douthat. He's the author of the new book, The Decadent Society, How We Became the Victims of Our Own Success. Good morning to you all. Ross, let me start with you. Um, how are we defining decadence in 2020 in America? <clears throat> Decadence means that we're stagnant and stuck, and we want to get back to the future that we once imagined we would have. And I think this is something that defines both the appeal of Donald Trump and the appeal of Bernie Sanders. Um, I think if you look at what Trump's slogans were in 2016, make America great again, it's basically saying to the country, we were going somewhere better, we didn't get there. Let's try and get there again. And Sanders is saying the same thing to the left. Sanders' message is, we were going to be Scandinavia, right? What happened to that? We, we were going to have universal health care and amazing Swedish movies. And why, why can't we get back to that? And they're both messages, I think, for a country that feels like it's stagnated and hasn't grown and hasn't been as dynamic as it was in its not-so-distant past. Yeah, and you know, and, and as Donald Trump would say, not only do we not get those great Scandinavian movies, we're now getting <laughs> South Korean movies. Oh, my God. Hey, you know, Rosso, it's very important. It is, it's, it's looks like a, a fantastic book, and I've read some about it. I, uh, and you're very careful to say that decadent, a decadent society, I think this is extraordinarily important when people see the title of the book. You're not going on some moral screed. Decadence is not connected just to a decline in moral values. It's more of a stagnation, more, more, of a, more of a collapse of innovation, right? Yeah. It's a, I'm borrowing it from a famous scholar named Jacques Barzun who said, decadence isn't a slur, it's a technical label. It's for a society that is rich. You can't be decadent without having been successful, right? right. You can't be decadent without having achieved a lot. But you're decadent once your growth rates have slowed, all your technological advancement is adding up to Theranos and WeWork, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and when, you know, your birth rates are declining and when people don't have faith in the future anymore. And I think a lot of populism in the West comes out of that, this sense that not that things are collapsing, right? This isn't a book about the imminent collapse of America, the barbarians coming in to right. sack the palaces. It's about what happens when the country and a whole society feels like it doesn't have faith in the future anymore and it can't move forward and it just makes Marvel blockbusters over and over again mm -hmm. from now until eternity. Let me just say though, the Marvel blockbusters, all 22, 23 of them, very consistent <laughs> middle fair filmmaking. My kids and I absolutely loved every one. I, I wish this, and I know you're a big Star Wars fan like me, I wish there'd been a little more consistency in the nine Star Wars. Um, I'll be quiet now about, about films. No, no, it's, it's true. St the Star Wars movies are more decadent yes. than the Marvel oh, movies. That is absolutely the case. Without a doubt. So, Ross, before I get to everybody else, instead of this just being a conversation between you and me and us being completely rude, I... My mother would be embarrassed that uh, as a southerner, I'm not sharing the conversation more. But you, you, I think it's really cute how those of us uh, around the table, and I'll just put it on me especially, have been talking about all these horrible things Bernie Sanders once said and how this is going to spell doom for Bernie Sanders in Florida and how this is going to spell doom. It sounds so much like 2016. And I just sit here, we, we talk about it, and I'm just thinking, this, this is so moving Bernie, not because of us, but just because whenever the establishment is up in arms about Bernie actually embracing you know, communist dictatorships, it just has the reverse effect and helps him out. And you wrote a column about the three ways Bernie Sanders' rise uh, is, 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 is shadowed by what happened to Donald Trump in 2016. Go through yep. that. And tell us why we are going to see the same Marvel movie over again in 2020. <laughs> I mean, basically what you have in the Democratic Party is the same failure of party institutions, right? You know, Democrats spent 2016 laughing at Republicans and saying, oh, your party is so weak, it can't stop this businessman who used to be a pro-choice Democrat from taking over the party. And now the same thing is happening with the socialists from Vermont. And the lesson is, I think, in both cases that the parties don't really exist anymore, or they exist as sort of empty planes waiting to be hijacked by anyone who has 
a particularly passionate following. And that, I mean, that's, that's the lesson here. If you have 25 to 30 percent of the party behind you, you can do really well against a divided field. No one is going to tell, there's no party establishment to say, Amy Klobuchar, you have to get out of the race, or Pete Buttigieg, time's up, or Michael Bloomberg, what, what are you doing, for God's sake? That, that doesn't exist anymore. And so Sanders can win with 30 percent, and then the reality is then polarization takes over, and the party will unite behind him because the worst, you know, you got to beat Trump. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.